For our next topic, we'll talk about memory management. Now, normally, we haven't really discussed the um, performance of our code very much. I mean, we kind of talked about that a little bit when we first talked about the CEK machine, where we wanted every step to take constant time, and we didn't want it to be linear. Um, but we haven't really talked about the way that memory uh, is affected by the decisions that we've made. Now, um, when we write C key machine rules like this, where we say, you know, if condition true, false, environment K, and we say that this goes to focus on the C, leave the environment alone, make a K if, where we record the environment, the T, the F, and the K. Let's think about what that really means in terms of data structures, right? We start off with a tuple that's pointing to an if, all right, that's pointing to a C, a T, and an F. It's also pointing to an environment, and it's pointing to a K, all right? Then what happens is we then make a new tuple and that new tuple, it's pointing to C, so it's pointing to that C. It's also pointing to that environment. And it's pointing to a new structure, which is the KF. And that KF is pointing to that environment, that T, that F, and that K. So notice, <clears throat> that we have allocated two things. We've allocated a tuple, so we allocated something that has four spots. It has a spot for its label that says that I am a tuple and then three pointers. So we allocated four things for that, plus we all sorry, uh, yeah, four spots. And then for the KF, it has um, one, two, three, four, five spots, because it has five pointers plus one thing. So we allocated nine things. And now notice what over here is no longer needed. Well, we know that we don't need this anymore. Now, do we know that we don't need that if? Mm, maybe we don't need it, but maybe we do. For instance, we would need that if, if this were part of a closure and we are gonna run this code again. So the only thing that we know that we can deallocate is this code right here for um, that uh, tuple, in which case that really tells us that because we're allocating for and deallocating for, we can really just use the exact same memory for this structure over and over and over again. Okay? So essentially what happens here is that we are allocating this kif right here. Well, what happens when that KF is finally gone? Like, let's look at the rule where we say if we get a false and we have um, an environment that we in fact know is gonna be the empty environment, and we have a KF that has an environment, a T, an F, and a K. And what this does is it goes to the F side, the saved environment, and the K. So what does that look like in terms of the data structures? So we have something pointing to a false. So we have our code is, yeah, let me do it like this. All right, so we have our tuple and it's pointing to a false. It's pointing to an empty and it's also pointing to the KF. The KF is pointing to an environment, a T, an F and a K, right? And then we're gonna switch to a new tuple, which again, we don't really count as allocation because we're just gonna use the same space over. And it's gonna point to F, it's gonna point to the saved environment, and it's gonna point to the same K. In other words, the stuff that we don't need anymore is we, we're gonna reuse this space. That false, we do need that because Probably what we're gonna do is we're gonna make it so that there's actually only one false in our entire program, it's just, we just pass around the same pointer to it over. 
Similarly, there's only going to be one empty environment, so these are free. We don't need this kif anymore. Um, and that t, we may need that t because it's part of the if, so it may be somewhere. Now this kf right here, in before we added continuations, we would actually know that we could deallocate that. But once we added continuations, when I say continuations, I mean first class continuations, it turns out that we actually need that because it could be the case that that is being pointed to by some continuation object. In other words, it's no longer obvious when we have to do um, when we can uh, free the memory associated with this. So memory management is a real issue inside of our language. Um, and of course, it's a real thing, uh, you know, in general with like normal programmers. So let's talk about the idea of memory management, and then we'll come back around to how to integrate memory management into our, um, uh, into our system. Does that make sense? All right. So we have to ask the question, what should a memory manager do? Essentially, what it needs to do is it needs to know uh, when to call free. Let's actually step back at that one moment. Really what a memory manager does is we would like to make our programs under the assumption that we, sorry, uh, like assuming that we have an arbitrary amount of memory, but then we want to actually run our programs with a fixed amount of memory. So I'd like to write my program as if I had infinite memory, and then I want to actually run it with, you know, the one gigabyte that I actually have. Okay. And so that means that there's going to be some amount of churn of what memory we're currently using, um, and then we're going to not need something anymore, and then we'd like to reuse that. And we're going to call the function free when we want to say that we're done with this memory and we it is now we're done with this space and it's available for being reused. Does that make sense? I shouldn't say does that make sense. This is a stupid in a uh, in a video call. Sorry, in a uh, recorded lecture. So let's think about um, let's think about some potential strategies for doing memory management and some potential hang-ups and ways of thinking about it. So, like, the, the simplest memory manager we could possibly define is one that um, calls free only at the end of the program. At the end of the program. End of program. In other words, if we were to take, if we were to make a graph where here is time and here is memory, then the graph of this program would be that we allocate, 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 and then the program is over and then it sharply drops to zero. And so this is, you know, the program's running. And then here, the program stops. Okay, so that memory manager, um, you know, uh, it's not a good memory manager, um, but it is definitely a correct memory manager. And this should make us think about, well, what does it mean to be a correct memory manager? We, in memory management, we talk about the idea of soundness as correctness. And the key idea of soundness is that imagine that you have your function f of x, and if we had infinite memory and we ran your program, when you called it, you would get the answer a. So this memory manager would give you the answer a. If any man, if any memory manager, if any memory manager returned b, then it's wrong. Okay, so think about it in the context of like C programs that you've written before. You've written C programs before where you call free in some places. You call malloc, you call free, you do all these things. And if I went through your program and I just deleted all the frees, just they never freed anything, it's just always malloc more and more and more. 
Maybe your program would suddenly use 4 gigabytes of memory, but it would return some answer. Suppose the answer that returned was 20. Now, if I put in a free and it makes your program no longer return 20, then that free was a mistake. Now, there's all sorts of ways that your program could stop returning 20 and start returning something else. Like maybe it crashes. Um, maybe your program used to be a um, JPEG decoder and now it has turned into a remote shell client. Um, there's all sorts of ways that your program could be broken by inserting freeze. Uh, and if it's broken in any way, then that's a problem. Okay, so we're gonna restrict our attention where we're going to try to restrict our attention to only sound memory management strategies. But now the next thing that we could do is we could talk about, um, you know, different, like if this right here is sort of like the least efficient correct curve for a memory manager, um, the actual memory manager that you run is going to do something else. Okay. It's never going to go above this line because this line represents, well, hopefully it will never go above this front line. Yeah, let, let's actually like talk about that. So imagine that we had this program, but we inserted freeze in all of the perfect places. Now, what does it mean for a, a place to be perfect? We'll, we'll, um, we'll elaborate on this idea but, uh, but, uh, later, but essentially the idea is, is that, you know, we call free, we can call free, if an object won't be looked at. Okay, so what I mean by that is, is that like, you know, I'm up here in my office and there's a box over there and it has a bunch of weird wires in it. You know, every time I like get some, um, some product, some like piece of electronics and it's like, okay, another USB cable, I don't need this one. I have a little bag where I have all the USB cables that I need. And so I just take that and I throw it in the box. Okay, my guess is that I'm never going to need anything in that box. So if I just took that box and just threw it out the window, I will probably never even notice. So that's an example of something that I could free. In contrast, I couldn't free my phone right here because I'm going to use my phone all the time. So it's like an active object that I actually care about, so I can't get rid of it. So let's imagine that we could somehow know every object that we're never going to actually look at. In that case, if we called free, then every time we freed one of those things, we would like dip below this line and we could like, you know, keep growing and then we might dip below the line again and then keep growing and then dip below the line again and then keep going and then dip below like that. And so this little thing right here, might represent the perfect version, okay? So let's call that line down there the perfect memory manager. All right, but maybe it's too hard to know when something won't be looked at. Like here's a little example. So suppose that we allocate some object Okay, and then down in our program, we have an if statement, where the if statement says, if f applied to zero equals true, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use x. Otherwise, we're not, actually, and let's just say that if we do, we're gonna use x, and then otherwise we're gonna return you know, G. Okay, this is our program. So, and let's suppose that somewhere in here is, we're gonna use X right there. And let's say that this is on line 20, and this right here is on line 40. So where can we put a free? One thing that we could definitely do, we can definitely put a free after this. So this spot right here, is safe for free. And I'm gonna put a little asterisk there because that's not really, really true. All right, I won't put an asterisk there, I'll just tell you. It's not really true 
Because what if we passed x to a function that then like saved it inside of the data structure? Then it might not be safe to free it. But let's just assume we don't do that. So that's definitely safe because we're not going to use x after this. However, what if we knew that f of 0 never returned true? What if that was possible to know? If that was possible to know, then that means that we could actually call free back here. Now, you may know something um, about how difficult it is to analyze programs and predict what they do from your foundations class. Um, in which case, you may realize that it's kind of implausible to do that. So what that means is if our program looked like this, even if the perfect memory manager would call free right here, in practice we can't actually do that, we have to free at some earlier point. Sorry, some later point. So that means that it may be the case that our real memory manager follows a path that's more like this, where it can't free in the same way as the perfect one, and we'll call this realistic. Okay? So the, the, the tight one is perfect, the gapped one is realistic. All right. Now here's the thing. Our memory manager, it keeps track of information because it has to keep track of like where the memory is on our system that we can use. So that means that our memory manager is itself a client of the memory system. So what that means is that it may be the case that our memory manager uses more memory than our program actually does. So its memory usage might look like this, where it uses slightly more because of some overhead, but then it ultimately does a good job for us by making it so that it keeps track of the things that we don't need. So at some point it's above our trivial line, but then it can dip below. <clears throat> So let's call this overhead. All right. Now, all of these different strategies, uh, all of these different issues when you're thinking about um, memory management are, are all relevant. When we talk about a memory manager, we're going to talk both about whether it's sound, meaning whether it's correct, but we also want to talk about whether or not it uh, has any costs like this. And it's hard to really uh, choose a single number that is the only number to care about. Like maybe the thing that we care about is what we'll call the peak number. So the peak number is the highest value that we ever get. So for instance, the peak value is this for this one here. I think that's the peak. And I think this is the peak for that one. And why is the peak number relevant? Well, the peak number is relevant because if you don't have as much memory as the peak, then you can't run this program. All right? Well, now, what's another thing that might be interesting? Another thing that might be interesting is the gap between the perfect thing and this uh, allocator. So that's interesting. Another thing that might be interesting, interesting would be like the average amount of memory. And why is the average amount of memory relevant? Well, because maybe you're running your program for a long time with a whole bunch of other programs and you want to know how well it, uh, you know, how good of a citizen it is. So there's all sorts of ways to talk about um, to talk about the quality of a memory manager when it comes to um, when it comes to memory usage, but we can also talk about the memory manager from the perspective of time. So what do I mean by that? Well, you're going to run your program, and it's going to start at say time zero, and then it's going to run for a while, and then it's going to stop and get the answer. Now. If you didn't have a memory manager at all, and memory management and memory was just free, then that means that you're never going to stop running your program and go off and do memory management. So maybe your program plus the memory manager is going to look like this. It's going to start, and then it's going to go, but then it's going to switch off and go be the memory manager for a little bit. And then it'll run for a little bit, and then it'll be the memory manager. And then it'll run for a little bit, be the memory manager, and then it'll run a little bit more, and then that's when it ends. So now this right here represents time overhead. 
And this is a real thing. Like in your C program, when you call malloc and when you call free, like that is not your program running. That's the memory manager running. And any time that's taken up for that is stuff that wasn't doing the job that you care about. All right. So that time overhead is interesting. But here's another thing that's interesting. Have you ever run a program where it ran and then all of a sudden it just like completely stopped and you like couldn't use it at all? So programs like Eclipse do this all the time. That is an example of overhead for memory managing. And it could be the case that maybe this program, whoops, that maybe this program actually has a small amount of overhead relative to the perfect version, but it has a gigantic uh, gap in your program running. We call this a pause. And a program may have, um, you know, a few medium-sized pauses, or it may have, like, you know, really big pauses. Now, what if we had a program like this, where it ran, you know, a little for kind of a bit of overhead, but its pauses were like this? They were all guaranteed to be super, super, super small. We call this a real-time collector. Sorry, a real-time memory manager. And something like this might be useful in, like, you know, an application that's controlling a piece of, like, an engine. Or it might be useful in, like, a video game where you want to have an update every 16 milliseconds. Um, and you don't want to have giant pauses because that interrupts the play of the game. Okay, so there are all sorts of different ways to evaluate memory managers. Um, and I'll use these concepts um, when we, you know, as we, t as, now we're going to switch and talk about a few different strategies and we'll talk about, um, uh, we'll talk about how to do, how, how to uh, use these ideas to um, determine if a memory manager is, you know, high quality. So let's talk about the first kind of memory management that you're probably most familiar with. And that is um, manual insertion of free. So if you write C code, and you've written C code before, then you're probably familiar with just like going through your program and just calling free at the places when you think something isn't needed anymore. So the question is, is this sound? Is it sound? And the answer is definitely not. And the reason why it's definitely not sound is because you put in freeze whenever you think it's right, but there may not actually be right. And since you can't possibly know what that is, because whether or not something is free, turns out, sorry, whether or not something um, could be freed is this global property that is very difficult for you to keep track of. The key idea comes from what's called an alias. An alias is that when you have one object in memory, object in memory, i.e. one pointer, but two references to it. References to it. The thing is, is that most people, when they think about when something can be freed, they think about something like, well, I have some function f, and in it I define some, you know, character string, okay, and then eventually I return, and since I return, that means that right here I can call free because I'm done. However, what if inside here we did something like call the function f and gave it c? Now, what if, sorry, call the function g and gave it c. Now, what if inside of g, it's got our character pointer here, and what if what it does is it says global c equals c. Now, our global variable up here, global c, is pointing to the same memory. And so this is called an alias, because the single object in memory, this actual thing that came out of malloc, has two names. It has the name C, and it has the name global C. Turns out that it actually has three names because it has this local name too. 
So it's very difficult to get soundness because it's very difficult to track aliases just in your head. Now there are a few techniques that you can do to make sure that you can track your ownership um, uh, manually. And it's essentially a strategy for writing C code. And the strategy is, is that you always assume um, you cannot free. And therefore, you always make a copy, make a copy rather than an alias. In other words, code like G, it gets in a pointer, and it has to assume that it cannot call free, and it cannot take, and it cannot make an alias. If it assumes those two things, then that means if it ever needs this value for later, it has to make a copy. And then that means that the code f can assume that it is the only one that knows something that, that has the value and therefore its response and now it must call free. There's an alternative way, which is really a way to think about it, is, is that you track what's called ownership. Track ownership. Where you either own something and you must call free, or you don't own something and you must not call free and must not create aliases. And so if you rigorously follow that strategy in your code, then you could produce something sound. If you're familiar with the Rust language, essentially what it does is it enforces ownership as part of the compiler. Now, doing this is very tedious, so that means it's kind of unpleasant, but it's still technically sound. But every one of these copies, when you would have rather had an alias, you should really think of that as overhead of the memory manager. It's overhead in terms of memory, and it's overhead in terms of time because it costs something to do copies. Now, most people don't try to do this themselves when they write C code. Instead, what most C programmers do is they use what's called reference counting. It's also called a smart pointer. The idea of reference counting is, is that you have an object in memory somewhere, and it has pointers coming into it. And what we do is, next to the object in memory, we keep track of how many pointers are coming into it. We essentially take every data structure and we add a little bit onto it. And then what we do is we make it so that every time you reference an object, you create a new reference to an object, we call a little function that we're going to call, what do they call it? Um, it's called retain. And retain is going to take a pointer, and what it's going to do is it's going to look at the count of that pointer and then increment it by one. And then every time you destroy a reference, we're going to call that release, what you do is, what you're going to do is you're going to say p count minus minus, actually, We'll write it like this. What we do is we say if minus minus p count um, is equal to 0. So we're going to subtract 1 from it. And if we get to 0, then we're going to call free on the pointer. So if we go back to this example program, when we call malloc right here, that is a retain. When we get out of this block, that is a release. When we pass the fun when you pass c into g, that calls retain. When we store it inside of this global variable, that calls retain. When we exit out of g, that calls release. So that means that we've called retain three times and we've called release two times. So therefore, the object still has a pointer to it up in this global variable, so it's not freed. Okay. So that's the idea of reference counting. And reference counting can either be done manually, where you manually call retain and release, or it can be integrated into the language, where the language automatically calls retain and release for you. So examples of this are like with modern Objective-C and um, Swift, um, reference counting is built into the programming language where it tracks objects going in and out of memory, sorry, in and out of scope, and will call retain and release for you. 
Um, if you use C++ um, with the smart pointers that are built into the STL, it uses all of the various um, uh, overloading operations in C++ to do it automatically as well. If you try to use reference counting in a language like C, you have to put it in, you have to do it manually, and you have to literally call retain and release. Um, and in programming languages like Python, um, we know that behind the scenes they use reference counting to do their memory management, and it was inserted in manually by the Python programmers. If reference counting is manually done, it is not sound because you could accidentally forget to call retain or call it too many times or not call it enough, right? If you call retain too many times, then you'll use too much memory, and you call it too few times, uh, then you'll be unsound. Okay, so that, those are those are problems. All right, but it turns out that there are other quite big problems with reference counting. The first one is that counts aren't free. Counts aren't free. It actually takes memory to store these counts, and it takes time to update them. Because every time you're about to look, so you're not even looking at this object, you're just passing a pointer to it, you have to go over to that space, bring it in from cache, modify something, and then when you release it, you have to do a branch. So those are expensive operations at the microarchitecture level. Furthermore, you're adding counts to everything. Like, let's imagine you just had a, a singly linked list. That means you have a pointer to the data and a pointer to the next thing. And now let's add in one more thing to store a count. Well, that count is presumably some amount of memory, let's say it's 64 bits, and that means that you've increased the amount of memory you're using by 50%, because you used to have two pointers, two word size things, now you have three word size things. All right. Now, the next, so one way to try to ameliorate the fact that counts aren't free is you might say, like, well, rather than using 64-bit, what I'll do is I'll use 8-bit things, and maybe that's cheaper. Okay, so you could try to ameliorate the memory cost by making it cheaper, but it's thus smaller. But there's a problem then, which is that what if right now there's 255 things pointing at something, and then you made one more pointer to it? Well, now there's 256, but there's only 8 bits, so therefore there's zero things. Now you think that it's gone and you free it. So essentially, there's kind of this weird situation, which is that... Um, if you try to save space, then that means that you limit the number of things that you can count, and if anything gets more than that, then you can never free it because you've lost track of how many things are pointing to it. Finally, the next problem is, is that what if we have an object that has one thing pointing to it, and then we use that to create to point to another object that has one thing pointing to it, and then we make this point back to that, now there's two things here, and then we release this, and now it goes back to one thing. And so now we have this little, this pair of objects in memory where nothing's pointing into them, but they're pointing to each other, and so therefore their counts never go to zero, and thus they can never be freed. So reference counting, reference counting, fails to release cycles. And there's a lot of different strategies that people try to do to deal with this. And essentially all they come down to is using some of the other memory management that, techniques that we'll talk about in a little bit. So essentially, in summary, reference counting can be sound if it's managed by the programming language, but it's not necessarily sound. In terms of time, it can be quite expensive because updating these counts um, is proportional to the amount of work you do in your program as opposed to the amount of memory you use. And um, they can be um, inefficient for memory because they can fail to release cyclic data structures like doubly linked lists or graphs. Um, and they can have this problem where they lose track of things. And finally, uh, you have to store the counts themselves. So what we'll talk about next time are um, techniques for memory management that are sound um, always and uh, don't have... Um, entire categories of programs like cyclic data structures that they don't handle. And we'll talk about that next time.